Okay, three, two, one, start recording. Got it. Nice. All right. Yeah, levels seem good. Sweet. Okay. Good to go, Chris? Yes, mate. Okay, nice. Should we, should we just jump straight in then? Yeah, let's do it. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Beyond Binary Thinking, a podcast where we try to discuss ourselves out of the simplistic and tribalistic binary debates, whilst remaining open to challenges and corrections as we meet differing opinions. From Cadiz, I'm Finn. From Plymouth, I'm Chris. And from Boston, I'm Evan. Thanks, Evan. So today, uh, joined by Evan Anderson, uh, head of the Grey Faction. Uh, you've done some inspiring work taking on pseudoscience and conspiracy therapists in the mental health uh, industry. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, can you introduce yourself, Evan, and the work of the Grey Faction? Because I'm sure people are maybe scratching their heads thinking, what's the Grey Faction? Sure. Uh, so I'm Evan. Uh, I'm the director of Grey Faction. Um, it's a campaign of the Satanic Temple. Uh, if you're familiar with the Satanic Temple, you'll know we're kind of the, the new um, uh, Satanic uh, religion on the block. Um, the, so Grey Faction is a, is a campaign that focuses on trying to end the Satanic panic um, so when we say satanic panic, we're typically referring to a period during the 80s and 90s um, when there was kind of um, these bizarre conspiracy theories around, uh, you know, satanic cults abducting and abusing people and doing it so severely that uh, um, people forget what happened to them. And then only with the help of a therapist could they then recover memories of what happened. Um, and of course, this... And that continues to this day. There's still absolutely. Kind, of some kind of moral panic, right? Going absolutely. It, it never really went away. It kind of just went underground. Um, so a lot of the same, uh, you know, psychiatrists, psychologists, and other mental health professionals that were really at the core of the satanic panic as far as laying down the the groundwork in a professional um, sense in the in the mental health field um, they're still active they're still practicing many of them were never even um, disciplined in any way um, so what gray faction tries to do is to bring some accountability um, for these people who are still around and still propagating these uh, dangerous and harmful conspiracy theories and pseudoscience. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, yeah, good introduction. Um, it came up when we were talking to uh, your colleagues, uh, Shalice Blythe and Kim, uh, on our episode for uh, the Satanic Temple. Uh, one of the things they mentioned was the McMartin Daycare Center case, uh, which I think... Um, I remember that, yeah. Yeah, uh, just remind us, refresh us on like, that specific case, if you could, please. Yes, yeah, so that was a case in uh, California um, where a mother um, noticed uh, some, um, I think some, some bruising or some, some scarring um, on her child and suspected abuse. Um, unfortunately, this, this woman was suffering uh, from severe mental illness at the time. Um, what ended up happening was all of these accusations started being thrown around. Um, so there was, of course, the, the daycare staff, or sorry, the, the staff at the McMartin Preschool uh, who were accused. Um, and it, it turns out the, the evidence for that child having been abused in the first place, I believe, was uh, disputed. Um, but in any case, it is, it is a very typical example of the satanic panic. And, and this is really what this case really is, is considered the one that started it all, um, at least in the United States, uh, because it starts with one accusation, um, even, if, even if it's legitimate, sometimes there could be real abuse. Um, but then it just really spirals out of control. Um, and a lot of this in, in the McMartin case was these uh, parents who uh, began panicking and a lot of other parents started to suspect their children were abused, started asking them questions and um, not necessarily in any kind of intentional way, 
implanting the idea that they were abused. Um, and oftentimes that took the form of not really, um, you know, not accepting no for an answer. Um, so kind of filling in, filling in the gaps and, um, you know, conveying to the, to the child that what they wanted to hear um, was that they were abused. Um, and then, and then uh, imagine you know, it snowballed some, to some absolutely point. it snowballed um, they started to suspect uh, satanic cult involvement um, because there were some undercurrents of that going on um, because of other other things like uh, Michelle remembers um, the book uh, by uh, psychiatrist Lawrence Pazder and uh, patient uh, Michelle Smith who, who later married um, yeah, so it, it, that's a very typical case where it kind of starts with one accusation and, and the accusation may be perfectly legitimate. There may have been real, real abuse, um, but then it just turns, it snowballs. And then all of a sudden you're looking for these tunnels beneath the preschool where, you know, children were supposedly taken, uh, you know, ritually abused and then returned, um, you know, as if nothing ever happened. Yeah, and, and you had just this unholy triumvirate of, um, you know, concerned, well-meaning parents, obviously wanting to look into it, uh, a, a police force that was kind of pushing these kids, as you see, some of the transcripts are horrific, and the kids, very young children being interviewed for hours upon hours, and just told, just, just tell us what happened, and then you can go, and so the kids are like, okay, I was abused, yes, okay, now you can have some candy and we'll, fine, you can go home and we'll come back tomorrow. Um, and then that combined with, you know, this uh, cottage industry, right, of psychologists who are paid to consult for the criminal justice system, right? So they're advising police, oh yeah, indeed, it is possible that they may have repressed some of these memories. And then these people are also prepared to speak um, in, in court and testify that, oh, yes, yeah, it's, it's possible that they might have not remembered it before, but then the mem suppressed memories got re-triggered finally. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then they're also obviously counseling these kids. So there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> yeah. Can we go into Elizabeth Loftus and all of her amazing research? Sure. So um, I guess she's among the first to kind of really do the research that helped to combat the satanic panic. Um, and what her research proved is that um, you can implant false memories in people. Uh, so the she's done tons of work in this area um, on memory and trauma and, uh, you know, recovered memories and that sort of thing. Um, so she's most well known for the Lost in the Mall study. This was a study, I, th I think it was a pretty small study um, in terms of sample size. I, I don't think there were a huge number of participants in this, but you know, that's, that's what it was like back then. Um, the golden age of psychology. Yeah, <laughs> you when, could get away with anything. <laughs> when no one really questioned um, you know, your findings. Um, but this sort of thing has been uh, replicated uh, and is, I think, very common these days. Um, so, Basically, they had uh, participants come in and would ask them about things that didn't happen. Um, so they, they actually managed to implant the idea that they were lost in a mall as a child. Um, and the first time they would suggest this to the participants, they would kind of say, no, I don't remember that. Um, some of them continued to say that they didn't, didn't remember it because, of course, it didn't happen. Um, but a certain number of them um, and, it, and it's a minor, it's a minority, but it's still, you know, a number, mm -hmm. uh, came to actually believe that they were lost in a mall, uh, as a child. And, um, they were not, they were not able to identify this as a false memory. Um, and so that really, I think that that experiment is so well known, um, because it provided really clear evidence that you can you know, suggest to somebody that something happened when it never really did. Moreover, yeah. though, it raises an interesting point philosophically about is that person lying? Because you would mm. you would sort of say, well, no, they're not, because they think it really they really think it happened, but they're not telling right. the truth, right? So it creates this kind of um, un, 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 not very clear situation, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really difficult though from a criminal justice point of view mm. because, uh, as we say, you know, like a uh, 
well-meaning police detective trying to get to the, the heart of it. Um, if you push people and, and the police know details, they're using that information and pushing it into, onto a witness. Mm. And, and then later on, that person might then recall it. And so it's evidence that they saw it. It matches up with the suspect the police have in their mind. Mm. Um, you, you can really pollute someone's uh, evidence given in a court case. And, and so Loftus did an amazing thing, not only proving it with the research, but then fighting, sometimes literally, <laughs> going up in court and testifying really, really strongly against these people, which were, and again, there's these consultants that are in the living saying things like flashbulb memory, like memory, memory is very strong and you should believe the witnesses and her being able to show that actually, you know, one memory, one witness, it, it's just too shaky a thing to necessarily convict someone of if there isn't much more detailed evidence. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Eyewitness evidence is something that the courts and, and juries take very seriously. Um, and I, I think that's something that needs to be reconsidered. How could that be reconsidered? Like what, what would the suggestion be like to change the strength of the evidence and still consider it? Or Yeah, uh, I, I think it would just be, you know, acknowledging that eyewitness evidence is not as strong as people often think it is um, that you know people can have these false memories and, and um, the danger is Finn there's like like I say I don't know if you've ever heard the term flashbulb memory but there's this idea in lay people's understanding of psychology that people remember trauma vividly and, and that their memory is very good and very precise right um, sort of like the where were you when you heard JFK was killed, yeah. was when the old thought experiment. Happened, and everyone was like, oh yeah, I, I can remember it exactly. And people think their memories are really good for, yeah. for traumatic things. And, and there's some studies that were able to show that. However, people like Loftus have shown the opposite is in fact the case. And although people might be very confident they remember things very well, that isn't always true. And so, so that, that's quite doesn't important. correlate to, to the veracity of the memory. Um, it, it probably plays a factor. If, if someone says it's shaky, then you could believe that. But uh, but yeah, the problem is, as, as I alluded to earlier, that there were these actual con paid consultants who were going into court cases yeah, and yeah. showing this psychology evidence that said, oh, memory is actually uh, rock solid. If someone, Especially if someone's stressed or shot of adrenaline, they'll remember things very clearly and in mm. detail and like a, and so, so we should trust them. Um, as you, as you're saying, it's not cut and dry, but uh, especially where you find examples of the police coaching eyewitnesses, mm. right. And examples of that in transcripts. Um, it's good to be aware of the dangers and the limitations yeah. of, of eyewitness memory. Mm -hmm. Is there, um, I have this like kind of layman understanding of, of memory and psychology and correct me if I'm wrong, because I may, I'm probably am. Um, the idea is that like, the more you access a memory, you're not actually accessing the original memory, but you're accessing like the last time you remembered it. Is mm. that just nonsense or is that, and so then over time, the idea is that it can change, the memory can. Yeah, it's, adapt. so it's a, it's a reconstruction. Each time you remember it, um, you know, you're, you can, you can change it each and every time. Um, right. It's sort of like uh, if you open a file on your computer, you can't really open it read only. Um, it's always uh, read and write. And, and there's probably always some, some changes made to make it more, um, more, maybe more cut and dry than it actually was. Uh, maybe you forget some of the nuance, some of the, some of the details. Right. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Probably, I think particularly things that you weren't focused on at the time um you you know the more fuzzy details uh those might either go away completely or they might be solidified even more um in a way that you know definitely distorts uh you know what originally happened mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah very interesting so that's you know sort of my introduction to the satanic panic the martin dacus and to loftus and her research um do you want to take us forward like towards more modern times um, and, and sort of incorporating that into w what you guys are working on at the moment? Hmm. Sure. Um, I'm glad you're here to talk about the, the, 
you know, 80s and 90s, because um, a lot of those details, I, I don't know that much about, uh, to be perfectly honest. Uh, my focus is really on what's happening today. Uh, what kind of malpractice are we seeing? Um, what kind of techniques are being used? And, and who are the people? Um, so I'll start with the relevant organizations. So the big one is the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation. Uh, this is a mental health organization. Uh, they were founded, I believe, in 1984 and originally named the International Society for the Study of Multiple Personality and Dissociation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they changed their name once or twice more before becoming what it is today, the ISSTD. Um, and really, the, the co-founders of the ISSTD are really some of the major players in the satanic panic. And a lot of them are still around. Um, so for example, Bennett Braun uh, is one of the co-founders. He is currently facing his 12th lawsuit, I believe. Um, he, in, in, he was practicing in Chicago uh, where he had, uh, I believe, a dissociative disorders unit at Rush Presbyterian Hospital. Uh, he claimed to be you know, an expert on ritual abuse that he had a ton of, a ton of client, uh, patients rather that, um, you know, suffered at the hands of these satanic cults. He had one patient in particular, uh, Patricia Burgess, um, who there's a great Chicago magazine article about her, uh, and, and what she went through. Um, she went into, went into therapy with, uh, Bennett Braun and ended up with all these really bizarre um, and disturbing memories of her parents being uh, part of a satanic cult of, um, you know, this massive, uh, basically child abuse ring going on um, involving not just her family, but lots of community members. Um, and it appears uh, Bennett Brown actually believed what was going on. Um, so there was one, there's several, several things that happened, but one in particular that stands out as the most egregious, uh, he was convinced that um, her father was feeding her uh, human meat um, in the form of like meatloaf. And so he, he had her take a sample of meatloaf and bring it in to him and then he sent it out for testing uh, to see what was in it. Um, spoiler alert, there was no human meat in it. Yeah. It was just beef or whatever. Um, so that's one example of, of a co-founder. Uh, there are others. Um, another that, that practiced with Bennett Braun was uh, Roberta Sachs. Um, both of them have been sued simultaneously in multiple lawsuits, I believe. So what's their like what's their motivation to do this? Do you think they're just genuinely like misguided and you know not very I, or, or are they is this, is there some other like nefarious intention there? I tend to think for the most part people are misguided. Um mm. I think a lot of them really think they're doing the right thing. Um that there is really this scourge of uh child abuse in the form of ritual abuse. Um that they're fighting against and they're uncovering it and and all of that um but as i find is often the case with these things it's like they've they've fallen for their own propaganda so there are people that keep going on about satanism and the evil devils right. like all these rock bands are trying to take mm -hmm. your children and that i i think at a certain point the first people that said it were just quite disingenuous causing a panic to whip up the troops in their church right mm -hmm. and, and, and unfortunately these are the people that it's, it's like the flat earthers, you know, I think flat, most people think that flat, the flat earth movement started as a, a, a people trolling, just what they could argue with a joke physics paper. And then some of the people in that group were like, yeah, yeah, this is right. And you're like, no, you guys, oh, it's too late now. Never mind. Another thing has a life of its own, right? Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, back to the ISSCD. So there were these co-founders. I won't go into the others, um, but we've written about them. Uh, and they've all played various roles in sort of igniting the satanic panic back in the 80s and 90s. And then the that really... Reignite. It was like reignite, wasn't it? Wasn't it like a satanic panic before that as well? They were, 
they were there um, in the 80s, like when it all really, oh, okay. when it all really started. Right, right. Um, and they provided the sort of quote scientific, really, really oh, pseudoscientific uh, basis for it um, in their discussions of trauma and memory and multiple personality disorder. Um, so they had right. this idea that uh, these, uh, this ritual abuse is stored in various personality states and you have to access mm. these personalities through hypnosis and other things in order to recover memory, uh, the memory of what happened. Um, so of course, I'll memory doesn't know, work that way. Um, this is, uh, I've got a master's in psychology and we studied it in the UK and it was really interesting how we studied it. It was sort of like um, when we learn international psychology, we were told that there's just some things that America does different you know, there's the APA, right? Uh, all the psychologists vote in what should be considered a new thing into the DESM, the Diagnostic Manual uh, mm. for, for Clinical Therapy. And we were told two things. We were told uh, China always votes for this weird condition, which is like the belief that there'll be democracy in China. And, and, they, and ch the Chinese right. government keep pushing for it as a, a madness because they're like, well, look, that's never going to happen. So clearly these people are delusional. So <laughs> international psychologists, could, you, could we please include this madness in, in the manual? And the rest of the world's like, mm, I, I don't think so, <laughs> no. <laughs> and then the other one's America, which suffers from a couple of things. One is the American healthcare system being as heavily privatized as it is compared to most developed countries. Um, some things have to have a classification just so insurance will pay out. So there's certain things sort of like, yeah. you know, mm. bo both your parents die. Um, and in order for insurance to pay out, that'd have to be called, you know, dual parental post-mortem depression. Yeah. Whereas in the rest of the world, you'd be like, that's not abnormal psychology. Obviously, that mm. would be sad. So, so there was a bit of that. And then the other thing was this multiple personality thing, which most of the, it's sort of a hangover of Freudian psychology, I suppose. And the rest of the world, if someone says, oh, I'm actually a second person, most therapists would say, no, you're not, but let's get you some help. Whereas there's a sect in, in America where they're like, yeah, okay, let me talk to this Billy and let's find out what's going on with him. Um, mm. And not surprisingly, that made that personality stronger. <laughs> right. And um, that's my take on it. My, my uh, naive laypersons. P please correct me if I'm wrong, Evan. Yeah. So we really focus on uh, getting people who need help, you know, the help that they need. Mm. Um, so, you know, we don't think so much about, you know, is multiple personality disorder, which is now dissociative identity disorder. We don't think so much about, is it real or is it fake? Um, we think, you know, the DSM operates by, you know, diagnosing people based on these, this set of symptoms. If people have those symptoms, clearly they need help. Um, if we attach a certain diagnosis to it, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't matter so much. Um, as long as people who need help, who, who suffer from, you know, symptoms of mental illness, uh, get help and get effective help, uh, not things that, uh, you know, further entrench any um, delusions or right. uh, psychotic beliefs they may be suffering from. Mm. Um, but that is an interesting idea about the sort of the over excessive diagnosing um, being a sort of an artifact of a privatized healthcare system um, that would make sense to me that that um, that 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 there's a connection there. Uh, but again, if people do suffer from symptoms, we hope that they, you know, get treatment that they need. If that if that requires some diagnosis to be attached to it, um, maybe that's not so great for stigma purposes and other things. But um, if, you know, as long as they get help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do think money can muddy the waters. Um, but to be to, to be fair, I've actually been reading in research for this episode um, the counter argument. Uh, there are cases where um, because you have this large national healthcare system, right? Governments are trying to cut costs, um, and, and and so sometimes they'll pick uh, an option like cognitive behavioral therapy, just because on paper it looks cheaper treatment times are shorter right mm -hmm. um and and uh, i don't have the expertise or have done the research to get into which uh, therapy it, it works and which doesn't but um 
I've read some examples where a cheap version of CBT has been given to people just because it's the most cost effective on paper method mm. and outcome patient outcomes have suffered as a result. So, so it's, I'm not just doing the too easy to do, not the American healthcare system thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the that's whole a bureaucratic side as well, right? The whole like people getting lost in the system with, you know, and you can imagine that, that the, if the doctors don't agree and they get referrals and oof, a bureaucratic nightmare potentially. Sorry, Evan. Absolutely. Um, so to go back to the ISSTD, I want to make sure I characterize kind of how they're operating today. Uh, so, I think this is crucial because yeah. um, as I characterize the conversation from what I learned, there was a problem in the 80s. Loftus came along and fixed it. Phew, okay. Yeah. But it sounds it's like this is still then. going on and the people that did it then weren't punished and they're still operating today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it seems like there's sort of a resurgence, maybe not so much in the repressed and recovered memory stuff. Um, although that seems to be here too, but but there does seem to be a resurgence of the satanic panic, especially with QAnon and Pizzagate and all that all that nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, so it is really important to to underscore um, what the sort of uh, mental health fringe that supports this uh, looks like. So in the ISSTD, they have uh, special interest groups. One of them is called the Ritual Abuse, Mind Control, Organized Abuse Special Interest Group. And um, this is where uh, these licensed professionals um, really can propagate conspiracy theories of the most bizarre variety. Um, so there's of course the Satanic Ritual Abuse Conspiracy Theory um, that's sort of been debunked and I, I think um, one effect of that debunking is that it's kind of shifted a little bit. So there's these other kind of sub narratives and, and other, you know, related conspiracy theories about uh, mind control. Um, so in in uh, the in the U.S., the CIA had a mind control program um, called MK Ultra, uh, where they attempted to do these things um, like create Manchurian they candidates. Like loads of acid, loads of LSD. Yeah, and stuff like that. they did. They did all sorts of horrible experiments uh, with the goal of basically turning people into like robots uh, that can do their dirty work for them. Um, and I think there were various other purposes for it. Um, but, uh, you know, as far as we know, it ended in the sometime in the 70s, I believe. Um, but there are people who uh, believe that it's continued. And some of them are licensed professionals in the ritual abuse, mind control, organized abuse, special interest group of the ISSTD. Um, and they'll talk about, that too. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, and they'll talk about these things at, um, you know, at the conferences that they have every year. Um, so mm -hmm. this, this is with full, full approval of the ISSTD as an organization. Um, and on top of that, uh, they'll talk about these things and they'll, uh, you know, these presentations, not, not only for the people attending it, but also the people presenting it. Um, can get continuing education credits uh, for it. Um, so continuing education, I don't know if this, this might just be an American thing, um, but if you're a licensed professional in pretty much any profession, I believe every couple of years or so, you have to prove that you've completed a certain number of continuing education hours. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the purpose, yeah, yeah. yeah, the purpose is to show that you're keeping up to date with what's going on in your field. Um, so the idea that you can prove that you're up to date with what's going on in your field by attending these lectures on satanic cults and CIA mind control and the Illuminati uh, is just it's bizarre just and, and it's really theory, shameful. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I thought it was just like related to people who, who weren't like necessarily educated in critical thinking or in the academic system, but you're saying that it's the opposite fact. Like there's people who are not only like who believe it, who are academics and practicing professionals, but who are also like leading conferences on it, right? Yeah, typically I think you're right. You know, this stuff is kind of mostly restricted to like YouTube comments, um, mm, but- It's a bot, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but then you see um, licensed professionals doing it and not getting in trouble for it. Um, there's been, we've filed many complaints um, about things people have, these people have said at the conferences. Uh, oftentimes nothing happens. Um, Do you go there like undercover? Uh, we have had people go in in the past uh, undercover and, and attend some of these uh, presentations. Yeah. 
interesting. That must be terrifying. I've seen from your website that you, you have successfully, uh, you've had a few wins recently, right? Taking mm -hmm. some stuff off of uh, the list of uh, continuing education credits. Um, yep. So that was, uh, that was survivorship. Um, so this was, this is another organization that's a little bit more uh, open about their conspiracism. Um, the ISSTD is a little bit more secretive. Uh, so, you know, they put on this facade that's very professional. And some of their presentations probably are fine. Um, and probably mm -hmm. do meet the standards, uh, you know, that you would expect for these presentations. Um, I think a lot of times they attract people who are genuinely interested in this topic of trauma and dissociation. Um, but then they have these presentations, you know, you kind of lift the veil a little bit and you see that they completely allow these bizarre conspiracy theories. Mm. Um, so survivorship is a little bit, op a little bit more open about it, even posting some of these lectures on YouTube. Uh, so, so this is another conference and um, the president of survivorship is a man named Neil Brick and uh, he's a licensed mental health counselor here in Massachusetts. Um, he claims to believe that he was a brainwashed assassin for the Illuminati um, sort of, you know, decades ago or whatever, uh, that he killed people, um, that he, you know, raped people, apparently, or he right. at least heavily implied that he raped people. You, you know how he's not telling the truth? Because he's alive and telling it. <laughs> right. If you would the, think... If uh, the Illuminati really existed, would they yeah. let him... <laughs> He was a super that. soldier. That was a right. term that he used. And um, if you look at the guy, I mean, he's he's no, no super soldier of, no. of a super okay. soldier. Ah, but that's the clever thing. It doesn't look like one. No, oh yeah, it. I guess you're right. Um, so he's the president of survivorship. Uh, he presents there, uh, you know, every year, usually multiple times. Um, and he has other other people a good come question. and present. What, yeah, go ahead. Status is survivorship. Is it like an organization or like? Is it just a company? Is it a group? Like what kind of level is it? Is um, it a bit fringe? Definitely fringe. Uh, yeah. Once you have a conference where people can earn credits that they need in order to re retain professional accreditation, mm. th there's, there's an easy income for them there, right? Like, mm -hmm. and, and you're fighting their ability to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. So back in uh, late 2018, um, uh, I filed a, or I, I had filed a complaint against Allison Miller, a psychologist in Canada, who presented at survivorship, um, talking about the strangest stuff, um, talking about how satanic cults supposedly operate, uh, talking about you know these fake surgeries where they implant black hearts in children to convince them that they're evil, um, that uh, you know. UFO abduction stories are really just elaborate scenarios set up by satanic cults uh, that, you know, satanic cults. Um, <laughs> That's like a conspiracy within conspiracy. That's oh, yeah. It's just, it's unbelievable yeah. um, that someone could wow. even come up with this. Uh, she was saying that satanic cult members uh, will dress up as God or Satan and rape children in order to convince them that God hates them or, or whatever. Um, some of the worst stuff I've ever heard. So uh, sounds so like the Catholic Church, but we'll, we'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so I filed this complaint, uh, you know, quoting at length the things that she was saying, which was again on YouTube on their yeah. on their YouTube channel, um, and uh, they investigated and kind of approached her about it. Uh, supposedly, she was in a semi-retired uh, licensure status, which meant that she wasn't even supposed to be giving these presentations in the first place. Uh, so she got in a bit of trouble for that. Um, so instead of facing our complaint, uh, which which we were assured was going to be investigated, um, or, or you know she was going to be given some sort of discipline for what she was saying, um, that uh, she decided to retire. Um, so we considered mm -hmm. that we considered that a victory. Uh, she can no longer call so, herself yeah. a psychologist. She can't present at these conferences, yeah. um, which is great. But, uh, and it's brilliant, but sadly, she spent a lifetime peddling that bullshit. Right. That's right. She wrote books that, you know, people, of course, still read. She had patients who ended up being therapists who then further this narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so that was one victory that we had. And then uh, earlier this year, 
Um, we had, oh, actually, I think Allison Miller lost her license last year. So that would have been, that would have been 2019. Um, but then earlier this year, we filed a complaint uh, with the American Psychological Association about survivorship, uh, you know, quoting some of their uh, lectures, quoting the board's decision regarding Allison Miller um, and stuff like that. And uh, there's actually a sort of a middleman between the conference itself and the APA. Uh, it's these uh, CE sponsor organizations. Um, so they kind of are responsible for the material uh, that, that happens or that, you know, is provided at these conferences. Um, so we, we didn't know who the sponsor was, um, but we contacted the APA to complain and they got in touch with the sponsor and the sponsor decided to drop the conference. And this was about maybe two weeks before um, the conference was, was going to take place. So they had to just remove the continuing education units um, altogether, uh, which I suspect is, uh, like you said, Chris, pretty big business. I think that's how mm, they make a lot like of their money. That. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and and it, it legitimizes this, this bullshit shill industry, right? Absolutely. And it brings people in who, you know, maybe you're a young professional, you need to get some more uh, continuing education credits for your, you know, to renew your license next year. And you see this conference is coming to town. So you're like, yeah, I'll go and see what it's about. And then mm. hopefully if you have a, a good head on your shoulders, you yeah, kind of laugh, laugh at it. But, yeah. uh, but otherwise you, you yeah, know, but become then, swayed by it. And yeah. Especially if they've got the backing of the APA and da da da, right? Like it exactly. legitimizes it. It's dangerous. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And there is unfortunately a lot of overlap between the ISSTD and, and survivorship especially with the ritual abuse, mind control, organized abuse, special interest group and survivorship there, you know, a lot of the same, a lot of the same players are, are involved in both. And so what's their motivation? Is their motivation, you think, to make money? And then um, to different organizations to try and expand a bit more? I think the purpose of survivorship is sort of like to be like run by survivors. Um, and, and survivor therapists, uh, they kind of split their conference into, into two. So one is like a, a therapist conference or professionals conference, whatever they call it. And the other is like the survivor conference. So, so we have people who identify as like survivors of ritual abuse going to the survivorship conference. And um, it's, because there it's are cults, expensive. right? Like, no, you know, of course. Not, forget satanic panic, but there have been some very weird cults and the, there are some high profile pedophile cases. I think it's what makes it so hard to grapple mm. with because, you know, at a certain point, they're using these actual cases as a human shield, right? <laughs> right? Like, oh, so what's your problem? Like, we're trying to help survivors. Are you against the survivors of rape? Mm no this way of handling it fuck yes <laughs> oh my god absolutely and the the it, it that's all contained within the name ritual abuse mind control organized abuse special interest group you take the organized abuse cases which of course there are you know there are people like epstein and others but then you you attach ritual abuse and mind control to it and it's like if you're denying one you're denying all of it so then you're just an apologist for you know these these sex traffickers and and pedophiles it's it's unfortunate it does make it difficult but i think people really i think people are starting to catch on um yeah you know people are starting to recognize that you don't need these conspiracy theories to to fight against human trafficking no, and you um, can care about something, but realize that hysteria is not a productive means of tackling it, right? Like, right absolutely. Yeah. Did you guys see the Wayfair stuff? Uh, yeah. a couple weeks back? No. I was so confused by that. I was so confused. My take on it is that... Um, Should we explain it first? Uh, yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Before right. I shit on it. <laughs> can I explain it? And then you correct yeah. me if I'm just completely misunderstanding. There was a furniture website. Well, it was like a website where there is a bit like eBay. And they were selling expensive closets, basically, for like fifteen thousand dollars. And then there was basically a conspiracy theory that it came well, with. Oh no, no, no like, a bit more detail. Uh, with with it, obscure names, right? Uh, the furniture the ads, the as every modern somewhere. product does, right? Yeah. Like some weird obscure name. And then the theory was that why would you buy a cabinet for twenty thousand dollars unless it included 
a child that had been yeah. abducted. So they're mu- therefore <laughs> facts. My, right. my take on all of these conspiracies is, um, the, as you mentioned, right, the Epstein. The, there's demonstrable things that yeah. already we're not doing anything about. I don't think anyone believes Epstein killed himself, by the way. So there's already demonstrable things that we're not doing anything about. So I don't care if maybe this or maybe that. You're like, look, let's deal with the thing in front of us. And there is an argument that a lot of the QAnon bullshit is, again, people following Russian bots, the sabotage, misinformation, nonsense spreading thing. I think people are perfectly capable of fucking up themselves, but I think that is is pouring kerosene on the flames. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's an argument that it's it's a good way for Trump defenders to make noise about the, oh, you think his friendship with Epstein is bad? Well, look at this even worse case that we have no Wait till you see how expensive these closets are. Yeah, <laughs> what's your take on it, Evan? Yeah, I mean, pretty much the same thing. It's really unfortunate that, that it's almost like uh, some of these things that we know are happening aren't quite bad enough uh, that that we have to include things like satanic cults and mm. uh, you know bizarre rituals and stuff in order for uh, in order for I don't know people to care about it. I guess it, mm. there to it's a bizarre yeah. it's a bizarre thought pattern. Um, and and people do tend to look for any kind of evidence of you know s- bizarre satanic cult stuff, um, like uh, on Epstein's island. There's that like temple or whatever that looks like super strange, um, but people you know say you know this is evidence that you know it, he's part of a satanic cult and uh, you know all that stuff. And it it is really unfortunate because there's so much work to be done to fight uh, human trafficking and all that stuff. Um, Mm. There are high profile Mm -hmm. pedophile rings uh, that need to be broken up and the perpetrators arrested. Um, But then some of the people prefer to focus on, you know, bizarre cult conspiracy stuff. So there's someone named uh, Michael Salter, who's a a criminologist in Australia, who's uh, become pretty prominent within the ISSTD. Uh, he used to be the, I, I believe he was the chair of the uh, Ritual Abuse Mind Control Organized Abuse Special Interest Group. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure he's the one responsible for tacking on the organized abuse uh, part of the acronym. Um, he focuses on organized abuse and, and stuff like this, how uh, technology can facilitate um, these sorts of horrible crimes um, against children. Um, but he can't seem to resist adding in the ritual abuse stuff. Um, uh, It's really unfortunate. I mean, he he starts, you know, implying that, uh, you know, the McMartin case was just too soon. We weren't ready for the kind of evidence that uh, we were seeing there, that that there really were tunnels beneath McMartin, um, that the satanic panic is just kind of a... Yeah, he, he thinks the satanic panic is, is really just a narrative uh, by, you know, perpetrators and their apologists um, to to prevent us from acknowledging how bad uh, child abuse really is. Um, it's really unfortunate that, you know, he, he's clearly capable, I think, of doing good work. Um, but then he starts to talk about this stuff. And um, it's it's wasted, wasted talent as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. Deeply concerning. I was going to ask you, actually, because a lot of this, the basis of it seems to be, uh, the word gets overused, but Christian fundamentalism, right? Like the the fear of Satanism as a thing, which ironically, you guys have made a real thing <laughs> since then. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so, so I guess that plays heavily into it, right? The, the, the idea that there's good versus evil, heaven versus hell, there's actually a devil, uh, the idea that you guys mock so well. Um, I was wondering uh, if you in your organization had any interaction with things such as gay conversion therapy, because that seems a, an obvious area where mm. Christian organizations would overset the mark into psychology and therapy. Um, yeah. We have not done much on conversion therapy. Um, we think it's repulsive. We think that needs to end. Um, there are organizations that are fighting it, and um, it could be that they're in 
those organizations are in a position to be much more effective than we could um, with a lot of things um, throwing our support as a satanic organization behind it um, can be harmful. Yeah. So we have to take those considerations <laughs> that I can appreciate. into account. Pick your battles, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the big thing with, with uh, you know, fighting conversion therapy is um, we're so, we have so much work to do to, to try to end the satanic panic. Um, we're the only remaining international organization dedicated to this work um, to try to focus on other things like conversion therapy at this point. Um, would, mm. We would just spread ourselves too thin. Oh, no, um, yeah, no, of course. I was just, you know, w uh, wondering if it was something you were following and interested in uh, rather than it, it, it sounds like you've got more than enough to chew on at the moment. I, I just, you know, read and it's shocking to me that um, gay conversion therapy is still funded by Medicaid. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Um, In some cases, yep. And the wow. Democrats were trying to push for it that it, to get defunded. There's all these Republicans who are like, oh, we should defund Medicaid. It's a waste of taxpayers' dollars. And they're like, it like exhibit A? <laughs> like, like, this one? And they're like, no, nah, not that. that that's cool. <laughs> that's fine. Oh, yeah. That's just shameful. Wow. That's mad. Um, Good God. Yeah, I was going to mention a point... Um, I don't know if it's that relevant to what you do, but I thought it might be interesting to get your take on it, Evan. There's um, someone I know who is part of the existential analysis. So it's a society for existential analysis. Uh, uh, and it's like psychiatrists. And they, they're taking like a completely different approach to, to kind of psychiatry, which is like, I know it's different from psychology. Um, but do you think that that's an issue in, in psychology or maybe in psychiatry specifically that like is an overconfidence in the way that things are? Because that kind of seems to link to what you were saying about, um, you mentioned, we were talking about scientific studies, no? that a lot of the things in psychology are perhaps not as, as strong as we would like to think. So basically this society is more about uh, the psychologists and psychiatrists in that society, as far as I understand, they're working through with the with their clients with their patients and they're not like in a in an extreme figure of authority a position of authority so what's your take on that is there something true there is psychology um, just quickly what i'll say is there's about eight strands you need to unpack with that sentence <laughs> you really, really long question so. yeah you know and then they really are there's a lot of density in what you just said so um let's start evan i think with the the replication crisis which you alluded to earlier right. could you could you explain it to finn and our listeners sure uh, i'll do my best um i'll help <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I think it was Unitas, is, I think that's how you say his name, um, published a paper that reviewed a lot of uh, uh, psychological findings and basically said most of these are probably actually false. Uh, did so you he, read the troll study that went hand in hand with that? Um, so as is often the I case, right, there was a very good and earnest meta research which showed the problems with uh, replicating famous old studies that we all know and love and m most average lay people will, will have heard of. Um, uh, but, but actually the, the precursor in one of the initial volleys, as is often the case, w w was a troll study where he was able to prove uh, ESP, extrasensory perception, as a thing, using the same techniques and methods and math, importantly, because it gets into p-hacking, right? Uh, using the same math that other psychology studies had used was able to prove complete nonsense. Yes, absolutely. Thank you right. uh, for, for that context. Um, yeah, so basically he, he pointed out that the way we're uh, analyzing results uh, kind of cherry picking things using multiple hypotheses um, and not adjusting for that uh, small sample sizes uh, you know uh, and I, I don't know if he was the one that pointed this out but the file drawer effect also where uh, studies will be done and then not published because journals prefer to publish significant findings um, but then 
um, only the significant findings will make it into the journal. So you have an avalanche, right? So there's someone that says, mm -hmm. I'm interested in something. They're an authority in the field. They've published books. They are financially motivated to do evidence. The people that are drawn to them as their students who, who are PhD students who are running the classes, who are then giving classes to a bunch of undergraduates who are also looking up to these people. And sometimes they're sat in the room while they're doing the experimentation. And there's a strong experimenter effect where mm -hmm. if you know what the experimenter wants from the study, you're quite likely as a participant to do it. And most of these experiments are run. You need to get course credit. Um, yeah. So you need to join a bunch of studies. That compounded with, as you say, the file draw effect. So if you find nothing in your study right and and I, I even had this with my dissertation for my master's so i found a positive result but my sample size was tiny and i've done uh, we didn't call it p hacking we called it p fishing i actually said this was 15 years ago before the replication crisis was a thing i knew exactly what i was doing you do mathematical experiment right you do you do this thing is this a significant result if that test fails, that there was a chart in our classroom, right? Like you do that experiment. If that fails, okay, there's there's a math that works more often. Anyway, you, you kind of just keep changing the standards and changing the math you do until eventually you get boom, positive result, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, because no one wants to spend six months studying something only to find out. Yeah, I didn't find anything. It was a waste right. of six months. I'm not even saying like it's corrupt or for the money. It's just, mm. it's more interesting to get a positive result after having studied something, especially if you get a good grade. I mean, I got a bad grade because I refused, even though I got a positive result, I said, yeah, but come on, we had a sample size of like 18 people. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and I'm about to generalize that. like uh, the religion of Islam on the basis of 18 people. I'm like, oh, yeah, no, sorry, I can't take it. So yeah. I got a two one instead of a first. I don't know if that's how Americans grade things. I got a B instead of an A, um, mm -hmm. which incidentally has never come up since. It doesn't matter, <laughs> but at the time it seemed important. Um, and then that combined with the fact that, like I say, the foul draw effect is really strong so you don't know how many people have disproven a study as bullshit but but mm -hmm. just because you fail to prove something obviously how can you publish and then why would a newspaper report on it and then why would you share on facebook right and the algorithm favor someone that said oh yeah this guy spent two years studying it and failed to find anything of significance it's, right. it's just not interesting so, yeah. so we don't hear about all the time someone proved a popular theory wrong. Mm. Right. So much of it comes down to those, those p-values. So we use the cutoff of 0.05 typically, which means that there's, you know, a 5% chance that, 5% uh, or less chance that your finding is just a fluke, that it just happened by chance. Um, so when you, but when you compound those, when you're like, okay, this this doesn't have a significant p-value. Uh, let's analyze it this other way. Let's maybe combine these groups together, split these groups apart. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we can then you know you do it. You do that twenty times or whatever, and, and there's like a hundred percent chance that you're going to get a positive result. The only people that apply for the master's course are people that are good at doing that. The only people that get PhD funding are the people that are good at that. People, even if it's not intentional, people learn, right? Find a positive result. That's what we're looking for. It becomes this mass delusion. It's really interesting. And it means yeah. that so many of our favorite studies from psychology, they're just not trusted anymore. The results- They're not if being you look replicated at, though. Like over time, like have some of these studies not been replicated with like a bigger sample well, size? This is it. They something. tried to, and often they did pre 2014. I don't know the exact year, but uh, yeah, often they were. But this is the foul draw effect. If they tried to replicate it and failed to find it, they didn't publish unless they really thoroughly studied it, in which case they were like, okay, here's my competing theory. I've managed to prove the opposite by my book.
but also using the same faulty math. <laughs> and, and what's really frustrating in this whole thing is that it's already entered the public consciousness. So there are certain things that we just accept as true because we've learned from psychologists. Uh, Stockholm syndrome. Uh, yeah, yeah. So everyone's heard of it, right? Thing. We had a, an expert that came uh, and lectured us um, and said that in, in all of her detailed, thorough research, Stockholm syndrome isn't really a thing. What happens is terrorists aren't always super evil baddies, right? They're actually people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes police are looking to end a siege quickly before too many press get involved. And, and so there's this thing where sometimes the police want to end it too quickly. Um, and sometimes the hostages don't hate the terrorists, right? Like just normal observable effects. Mm -hmm. But however, you'll have these psychologists who are consultants arguing that Stockholm syndrome is a thing Therefore, the FBI should storm the gates in the first four hours. Otherwise, the terrorists are going to hack the poor hostages' minds. And, and that makes that sense from a police yeah. department who doesn't want bad press mm. to, to smash the door in before the, the Fox News chopper shows up above, right? <laughs> but if you actually look into the data and the study like, and, and the meta-analyses, there's not good evidence that Stockholm syndrome is actually a thing. However, police forces act as if it was. Yeah. Huh. I, I Evan, I'm sure you have a better example. I didn't know that one. So thank you for ruining another psychological concept <laughs> for me. Um, <laughs> all, our, one, uh, all our heroes are falling. It's terrible. <laughs> uh, one big one that comes to mind is the idea of willpower. Um, so this idea that you have like a limited uh, sort of ability to or you have a limited say bandwidth for uh you know mental exhaustion um so there are findings like uh you know judges later in the day tend to give uh harsher sentences um to uh you know people found guilty or whatever uh, but I, I think i think there there was a uh sort of maybe if it was right after lunch they were a little bit better um because they had more glucose or whatever but then it you know crashed again mm. so that they had reduced willpower um and intuitively for us like this kind of thing makes a lot of sense you come home uh you know from a long day at work and you have limited capacity for listening to other people complain about their problems um and things like that you're, you're not going to want to you know take out the trash or you know whatever um, intuitively that makes sense um, there might still be a concept there but uh, you know this was a, a, a huge field of study for a long time and then uh, there were these people started to question it a little bit and then um, there are or there were probably still are uh, labs doing these sort of more massive experiments with you know a huge sample size to see you know if there really is something there if we really do have that limited capacity for um, you know I, I think it's usually emotional or mental uh, you know energy or whatever you want to call it um, and I, I think at the by the end of it it was like there might be something there but it's like tiny um, so that's one example. Uh, and, and of course, people talk about willpower all the time. Um, but also the replication stuff um, are really just, it, it speaks to a broader crisis in, in psychology that doesn't necessarily involve replication. It also involves some of these foundational studies that were really ethically flawed. Um, and the results are not as clear as as we are often taught in undergraduate psychology courses um, so two the, examples um, the are the, yeah i was going to say the stanford yeah. prison experiment uh phil yeah. zambardo okay, i'm sure you've heard of it finn yeah 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 the one where they got the they had someone saying give the guy an electric shock no give the prison no that's that's, that's that the one? milgram experiment um, yeah that, that's the other one i was going to say the, um, oh well okay let's go into both so the zimbardo what's the prisoner one okay. prison experiment is when they assigned people you're a prisoner you're a guard ah uh, yeah and then yeah. the guards abuse the prisoners right yeah go for evan i've teed you um, up. yeah there, there were a few issues with it like i mean beyond the ethical issues 
um, there was also like this idea that, um, and, and I believe it was actually just a class. It was it was Zambardo's class that he divided, um, which is a problem already. Yeah, right? Like, right? Yeah. yeah, there's the um, dual relationship there, uh, but the um, you know there was this. Obviously, they know what he's studying and and right. what his theory and philosophy is. Yeah, yeah. right. Huge <laughs> problems there, uh, and then you know supposedly the the classmates who were assigned to be prisoners some of them were um you know told that they could leave whenever they wanted but none of them actually did um and i think actually they it turns out they weren't told that they could stop it whenever they wanted um and then oh, and even the, their parents showed up and asked for some of them to be able to go home and they told their parents can't happen sorry <laughs> it was very yeah. bad yeah right that's really bad dubious, that's pretty bad, yeah so so that's another you know really popular one that um it's similar to the martin thing you can go home when i get the result i want from my study right, right. that's that the message the that's coming thing, from yeah. on top yeah. right. what about the other the the milgram what was it yeah mm -hmm. the the shocking one the electric shocks yeah so Did they, they had... really shock someone no, no, it was, no. Uh, they someone didn't, did they? acting, they, no. pretending they were being shocked. Because then when they got to like super high like voltages or whatever, and then the person just stopped like screaming or whatever. And they're like, oh. um, was that I, I don't know. I, I think they just wanted to see if people would actually go to the highest yeah. level of shock. So it was just um, an act of pretending, but what they yeah. were doing was seeing how high someone would go. Right, like right. Up the, and there was even a skull and crossbones in, in some versions of the experiment. Mm. Danger, high voltage. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and according to the experiment, 70% of people go really high. Yeah, and part of it was like these people would, would start doing it and then they would turn to the um, person in the room with the white lab coat on and say, uh, you know, this seems really painful. I don't know if I should continue. And, and the investigator would say please continue and they would keep going um at least that was the idea that we were told i mm. there was something that came out recently someone reviewed uh some reviewed the experiment and and some documents and the transcriptions right transcriptions yeah there was more to the story i don't remember exactly what it was i think actually a lot of them really did stop um after a certain number of shocks or whatever and refuse to keep going. Um, Chris, maybe you know more. Uh, uh, the replication failure of the Milgram experiment, I haven't had. My favorite though, um, what I studied at the time 15 years ago, was that there's one example where it doesn't work and the sample was Australian women. And the transcriptions for that, are, like, honestly, it's, I get emotional. Like, I, I actually, I'm not afraid to admit I cried reading it. So they did this experiment with Australian women. And, uh, and Australia is a unique sample through its own history and natural selection anyway. But, uh, but yeah, Australian women who are independent and against authority, the point, where, when the experimenter was like, after like 10 votes, the Australian women would turn around and be like, yeah, fuck off, mate. <laughs> like, if you want to shock him, why don't you do it fucking own self and <laughs> just get up and walk out? Like, 90% are just like, yeah, no, I'm done. This is bullshit. That's great. Yeah, actually, I, I just looked it up quickly, actually, and, and supposedly a lot of the people who, uh, you know, start kept administering those shocks uh, were pretty much convinced that it was fake already. Um, so I think it wasn't very, yeah, it wasn't very convincing. Things, Maybe it was the skull and crossbones it. gave it away, but... Yeah. yeah. Yeah, fair enough. And I, but this is it, right? Like, so there's a, this compound effect of uh, the professor who's selling books, who wants to make a bold theory, his students who want to pass the class and, and, and want to get onto the next level, maybe apply for funding to do further education. And then when you publish this exciting result, we've all read the Milgram because it's, it's good. It's good news, right? It's good clickbait. Mm. We, it's a 40, 50 year old study that we still know today. Mm. Um, yeah, you can see why this happens. It's not just you get paid if you come up with an exciting thing. It, it's more complex than that, but no one wants to study something for four years and, and then publish 
the results that say uh, everything I said for the last five years and have been teaching 2,000 people now might be bullshit. Sorry. <laughs> that's, that's a pretty hard right. admission to make. Yeah. Yeah. Part of it, I think, is psychology is really hard as a science. Um, human behavior is so variable. You have to control for so much stuff. And How by the time you do all that, study a human mind. Yeah. And by the time you control for everything that you need to control for, you might end up in a place where it's totally unlike the real world. So it has no external validity. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and, and, and it's a lot this, easier to study psych students who get course credit if they do your study. Right. That's another mm-hmm. big problem is, is most participants in these studies are undergrads at, um, uh, you know, universities. Um, there's the, uh, most of them are what we call weird. So uh, Western participant westernized, bias, right? Yeah. yeah, Westernized, educated, industrialized. Uh, I forgot what the R is. Um, and I think the D is democratic or something like that. But it's just a very specific demographic. So we don't know. You know, does well, this, this is my problem studying to... social psychology is that right. it was like, oh, here's what a Midwestern like upper class, well-educated sample size found on this study in racism. And, and, and I was like, I just Googled the demographic and I'm like, there's, there's only white people. Right. <laughs> that area. Why, why, why are we reading their study on racism? <laughs> yeah. We find a lot of these things don't apply cross-culturally. Um, hmm. Other, other countries, other um, groups of people are, are very different uh, in terms of, um, you know, whether these are, whether these are findings at all, uh, when you test on them. So the R, the R in weird actually stands for rich. So Western okay. educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. That's the majority mm-hmm. of, uh, psychology study participants. But that's not the majority <laughs> of like what psychology is of who but, psychology is. Definition. Right. It's, a, it's a very yeah. small number of people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and I should underscore it these scientific issues aren't just a problem of psychology. There's, there's a lot of bad science uh, in the medical field. Uh, so, you know, supposed treatments for cancer that don't actually work. Uh, mm. And then there's bad nutrition science. Um, mm. oh, gotcha. uh, so yeah, it, it, it is a problem, I think, with, with science uh, in general, in general mm. just the, you know, people's tendency to do bad science for whatever reason, convenience, ignorance, or profit. Um, Doesn't that really then in turn Pride. kind of lead to these kind of conspiracy theories and all of this kind of hyping of this, that, and the other? Because people don't really necessarily understand how to read the difference between a well-designed solid study with a good sample size versus so there is exactly this movement of anti-science right don't trust the academics uh global warming's an obvious one right the assumption that well anyone that's in climate change science Mm. doesn't get paid for the final draw effect and the sad thing is there is some truth to that criticism like i'm not about to come up with my hot take that global warming's not a thing (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you know, you can look at the studies that debunk global warming and they're often sponsored by oil companies. Right. Make your own assumptions from that. However, it is true that if you worked for, you know, the Icelandic Institute of, Glo- uh, of Climate Change, uh, or, uh, an institution I've just made up, you wouldn't publish, you'd still have a foul draw effect, right? You wouldn't publish your fail, failure to prove anything studies mm. as often. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there is some effort, I think, to change this sort of thing. Uh, so there are, there's things like pre-registration where you, uh, you know, indicate your hypothesis, how many participants you're going to recruit. Um, what methodology some, you're going to use. Exactly. What maths you're going to use to find the p-value. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. They make you spell everything out so that you can't really play any games with it. Um, and because the, the issue with sample size also is like people you might decide how many to recruit based on like, you know, you have the participant come in, they do the experiment, you run the numbers and you're like, no, we need more. It's not significant yet. And then as soon as you hit that significance, which could just be a fluke, because again, yeah. uh, 5% yeah, you chance. You just stop. If you'd, if you'd you studied there, 10 more, you then <laughs> they stop as soon as you hit it, right? Yeah. yeah. So that kind of thing is changing because of uh, replicate, uh, 
sorry, pre-registration, uh, more open science generally. Um, there are these, uh, I think they call them many labs, uh, where uh, this sort of network of psychology labs uh, around the US, probably around the world too, are uh, at the same time doing these experiments, um, trying to replicate a lot of the uh, findings um, that, that have already been you know, reported in the literature. Um, trying to see if there's really something there. Uh, sometimes they do find that, you know, some there's, you know, support for some of these things. They're, they're able to replicate some of these findings. Um, and there are journals who will publish null results. Uh, I think you might have to, um, you might have to pre-register or something like that, but they'll, you know, basically say beforehand that they're going to publish your uh, paper, whatever, whatever the results are. Especially now it's digital, right? Like 30 yeah. years ago. <laughs> How much does it cost? To you had limited space, to... but yeah, to, uh, yeah, we should be publishing no results because mm. like, I, like I say, even as an undergrad, like the, yeah. the pressure to have a positive result, I felt like- Doesn't really? that then mm. also allow for like in the future, more epidemiological, what are they called? Epidemiological, epidemiological? They're, when they do a big review of all the different studies. Met so meta they, studies, oh, yeah. they call yeah, them. Yeah. 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 So they can, they can study all these null results as well. Maybe that's gonna give us a better picture in the future, right? Given that Absolutely. So easy yeah. to electronically put them up. Yeah, meta-analyses meta are the best. If, if you're trying to think like, oh, is this a thing? And you Google it and you mm -hmm. see different studies saying different things, look for a meta-analysis that will take yeah. all these mm -hmm. studies and put them together and say... Here's the bigger uh, picture kind of thing. I mean, yeah, you exactly. say they're the best, but when I was studying, I always thought that was done by the nerds, right? There was the, the big <laughs> thinkers who were like, I've got a bold new idea. And then there was the guys that were like, I'm going to crawl through 5,000 studies. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you need both, though? Don't you need both? Yes. Like, yeah, uh, I agree. I'm going to take us out of the academic because this has uh, real world applications. Um, the theory behind this informs therapy. And one of the most interesting things I learned on my psychology course was a comparison of the effectiveness of different therapies, right? So uh, leaning on uh, different psychological therapies, uh, as we alluded to earlier, there's the the backing of Freud and my under yeah, and it is a shadow that looms large. And although I do understand your fight against obvious pseudoscience, what I do worry about in the context of the replication study is the fact that there's a healthy body of evidence that suggests not many psychological studies, no, not many psychological therapies work better than placebos so really interesting finding is that there there are still a lot of psychodynamic therapists who are following we'll call it post-freud right but it's still on the basis of freudian theory which has been mostly debunked by almost any study that's cared to, to review it I, thankfully, I probably don't want to fuck my mum and kill my dad. Phew. Whew. Sigh of relief. <laughs> However, um, the average therapist you'll meet has been trained by an organisation that, that believes that at the heart of its foundation. Now, how do we, as I say, like, obviously the work you do is amazing, brilliant to attack the obvious outliers, but, but what do we do with the 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 fact that we know that so many therapists are working under a system that when tested admittedly by a flawed testing system as we've just acknowledged fails to find proof that the therapy works yeah it's it's tough um so we like you said we focus on basically what what is bad? Uh, what really? What really Demonch. doesn't work? What's yeah, been terrible. Yeah. yeah. What really not not only doesn't work but causes harm, sure. uh, and we think yeah. that this recovered memory therapy really falls squarely in that camp. Um, so, when it, outside of gray faction and the great work you do, you personally like how do we? 
yeah how do we in this conversation handle the fact that a lot of therapists are working on debunked theories uh it's a good question um there is this huge disconnect between the science and the people actually engaging in a lot of the um a lot of the therapy uh um i don't know that we can even do anything about that uh even if we had good studies saying this works this doesn't um i suspect and i don't know maybe you can tell me what the placebo was in in the study or studies you were referring to but i suspect the biggest factor in whether a therapist is helpful is just the fact that they're they're there and there's someone to listen to it's, it's a human connection mm. um it you know the i'm sure the the specific techniques make a difference especially in terms of um you know whether or not they cause harm uh mm. but there might not be much of a difference between a lot of them as long as you have someone someone there that's listening to you yeah no no you know that therein lies the rub right like mm. if if the placebo is two weeks of treatment by uh, a junior person who's just going through the motions of what does an approximation of the therapy look like? All things look bad. When the, the test is, uh, let's look at a patient who's had six months of the treatment, everyone seems to recover, even though the actual methodology they're using can be debunked. You've hit the nail on the head. Um, uh, it's described as the dodo bird effect, if you heard this. No. So in Alice in Wonderland, there's a race. Everyone's running around in a circle. No one knows who's coming first because they're running in a short circle. And the dodo declares every, everyone wins. And, and so in therapy, it's described as the dodo bird effect because everything works. Like, like every, everything gets a prize, right? Like, and, and Not necessarily the truth is, everything for everyone, though, right? There's something might work for someone, uh, this one better yeah, for that person. Yes. So uh, the thing is, and, and I think... Um, uh, you, you said it succinctly, clearly. Um, yeah, Evan beautifully illustrated it, is that you have a dedicated therapist who spent years studying and years trying, not only because he's, or she, sorry, is a person that wants to help someone, mm. and then they have that experience and time and, and knowledge and they learn and adjust, but you also have a patient who has decided to take the commitment to improve themselves, hmm. to fix something, to repair something. Um, and, and, and in those cases, yeah, you, you do find mostly things work for the better and, and people do improve. Um, and so, like I say, uh, that's the, the other side of the coin to the cynical, nothing's been proven to work better than anything else. It's like, well, okay. When you have a bunch of dedicated people trying to help people, not going down Pizzagate conspiracy <laughs> theories, <laughs> um, you have a lot of people getting the help they need. Uh, yeah. So yeah. it is complicated, but it is hard to prove with science. But like I say, the absence of evidence isn't the proof of the evidence of absence, right? Mm. Yeah, I suspect it's similar with like personal trainers. Uh, you know, people are probably better off going and seeing personal trainers rather than trying to hold themselves accountable to going to the gym regularly. Mm. If you have someone there that's, uh, you know, encouraging you, maybe giving you a little bit of direction, that kind of pushes you ahead a little bit. You you know, that, that someone else is there um, helping you, I think is probably the biggest factor. Mm. And the willingness on, on your part to, to go is huge. Yeah, that's the key, isn't it? Yeah. And maybe the social obligation is like when you feel, well, I should do it because I've already booked a psychologist or yeah. a personal trainer and you're like, well, I don't want to let them down. So let's just sort it out. Also, if you're paying for it, there's the aspect of cognitive <laughs> dissonance. So you're, you're saying, well, I'm paying yeah, for it, so true. it must be helpful. Um, and that might help it. It must be working because it's really yeah. expensive. Yeah, 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 yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't underestimate the, the Benjamin Franklin effect it's called. Have you heard of that, Evan? No. Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, my God. Like, so I recommend this if you're interested in psychology or sales. Benjamin Franklin said in his diary, 
if you want a, a rich, powerful person to do you a favor, first thing you do is approach them and ask to borrow a hundred dollars. <laughs> You pay it back quickly and then instantly they're friends with you because of cognitive dissonance, which might not have been exactly how we understood it, but it does work. So I think, yeah. like you say, with personal training, just the level of commitment to something mm. is more likely to see you through the thing. Mm -hmm. Evan, wow, what an interesting conversation. I'm, uh, I'm really glad we, it, we were recommended to talk to you. I hope you enjoyed it. Absolutely. Thanks so much for uh, having me on. I, ha I had a great time. Yeah, is there, so it's been fascinating. Is there anything you'd like to recommend uh, people visit, check out, any resources uh, to learn more about Gray Faction and the great work you're doing? Sure. Uh, you can check out our website, grayfaction.org. Uh, we have a list of conspiracy therapists uh, with sort of profiles on, on each of them, uh, what they're up to. Um, we have uh, an official forum on Facebook called Gray Faction Official Forum that you can request to join. Uh, every Saturday night, we have uh, what we call Satanic Panic Saturday, where we watch some uh, classic clips from the archives of uh, Satanic Panic hysteria. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, check us out. We're on Twitter also at Gray Faction TST or, or TST Gray Faction, I can't remember one of the two um so you can learn more about us there great we can put those links in can't we, chris and yeah of course we will um if you have any cool outro music that we can put at the end of the podcast studies show that only 10 percent of people actually listen <laughs> and that study got debunked because it could be <laughs> <laughs> so i like to give it as a gift to those people who are um yeah, dedicated Hard enough course, to the end. So if, yeah. if you have any friends that want to promote any music, uh, please share it with us. Okay, I will. Yeah, I think um, Lucian Greaves, the spokesperson of TSD, uh, is in a band, so maybe something something from them. Is, is if the you could Kim's ask him, band? that would is be he, awesome, man. Is he in a band with Kim or not? It's different. I don't think so. I, think I could be wrong, one, but I think it's different. Yeah. I think it's different. Just, just yeah, that'd a be cool bunch of creative, of awesome yeah. people. Oh my God. I love it. <laughs> Sound. Yeah. Uh, do you have an inspiring quote to take us to the outro? Um, I know it's think. a big ass to throw at you. <laughs> uh, I'll let you Google it. That's fine. I had one from uh, Elizabeth Loftus, uh, which I'll give a go as a plan B until you come up with something better. Memory, like liberty, is a fragile thing. Um, here's one uh, by John Stuart Mill. Uh, he who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. Wow, that's a good one for Beyond Binary, isn't it? I like that. Yeah, nice, nice. Evan, thank you so much. Um, please send us URL links for anything you'd like us to uh, link to. And uh, yeah, really glad you were recommended. This was awesome. A brilliant conversation. Thank you. Yeah, I lovely agree. to meet you. Thanks very All much. All right, you too. Thanks. Take care. Yeah, let's keep in touch. Cheers, man. For sure. Bye. Thank you. Take care.